Hello, everybody, and welcome to our end of the year live Q&A here on the Dice Tower. Hello, Mandy. You're looking very festive today. Festive? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No. Oh. oh. There we go. Oh, my gosh. And they light up. Even better. <laughs> I have to kind of do this, otherwise you don't get the whole thing, but that's okay. You get the idea. I need you actually, I want to see the whole thing the whole show, so if you could... I know, right? Sit in this position the whole time. That'd be the great. Oh, Thanks. Good. Thanks. That, <laughs> I appreciate that. It's lovely to see you. It sounds like you've been really busy lately with the Dice Tower retreat that you just got back from. Oh, my goodness. It's the Dice Tower retreat. And then, oh, gosh, do I dare say it? Top 100. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have seen a few people ask. Mm, I know. And it's top 100 so much work i'm working on it but it's 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 a lot and then i'm still working on a teach and play for the hero realms of the lost village we just did that the other night so i'm trying to get that all sorted out um because i want to post that next week so just oh there's a lot <laughs> it's a busy time of year too very much so but you so, get no sympathy because yeah. you showed me all the pie buffet that you had at the dice tower treat <laughs> so you get what you deserve what? How do I do yes. this? Top 100 business. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, the tops are hard. I, I find them really challenging because you somehow there's pressure. And I think that you should just lighten up on the pressure on yourself, Mandy, and just be free. It's your top 100 in the moment. And if it changes, it changes. Oh, yeah. Let, just, let's clarify that. Tom keeps saying top 100 of all time. Yeah, no. I do a top 100 at the moment. <laughs> So that's that's what we're going for. That's good. You might want to temper that a little bit because if it's of the moment, then you know everybody's going to want a new one very oh, yeah. very soon of the no, new no, no, moment. No, no, no. So. This is like a once in a lifetime. Let's 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 not uh, let's not get crazy here. <laughs> yeah. And Christopher McKeon wants to know where they can get the penguin sweater. I don't know. Is everybody seeing the penguin yeah, sweater? So it actually goes. Up? Many penguins light up. <laughs> All the light up penguins. <laughs> so the. Sweater is actually from Walmart, believe it or not. So, but I got it Walmart last year, so I only wear it at Christmas time ish. Um, but I think they come out with new ones every year. But yeah, I got this one last year. It was supposed to be for like quote unquote ugly Christmas sweater, but so many people really seem to like it. So, I think we've officially moved beyond ugly Christmas yeah. sweaters. Right, it's taken on a life of its own, and now they're just <laughs> rad cr Christmas sweaters. Right, rad yeah. holiday sweaters, and exactly. like the ones that like have Star Wars or <laughs> Steven Universe or all these ones. They're, just, they're super cool. So I know, so it's fun. We'll see. I mean, we'll see how long the battery lasts. Maybe if it's bothering anyone, please let me know, and I will shut it off. I think, yeah, we'll let it run for a little while, and then I'll give it a rest. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So Robert's asking if we answer questions on behalf of the Dice Tower. Uh, if you mean on behalf of Tom, absolutely not. Never, ever, mm -hmm. ever. Please don't get us kicked off the show. <laughs> Tom will be on the chat. What are wait you a doing? minute. Wait a minute. What can we? <laughs> I know, right? We... Get Which, what game? What can we start saying Tom likes? <laughs> I don't know. Tom's tastes have been expanding lately. So I agree. Him and I have been agreeing on stuff lately. It's shocking. <laughs> and I think that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, what did you play at um, the Dice Tower Retreat? Did you play anything new? I know you were teaching things like Blackout. Uh, Hong Kong a lot. You were teaching mm. games that you knew, which is awesome. But did you get to play anything new? Uh, I mostly taught things I already knew. So yeah, so I played Blackout Hong Kong. I taught, so I taught that. I taught the boldest. I taught Key Flow, which I think I think talked about these on the podcast, with the exception of uh, no, I talked to them all on the podcast. New to me, I played um, oh Ariel. I think that's the one I played. Uh, Ariel. Yes, I know, and I should say it properly, you know. I looked it up on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I was typing it in and listening to sound bites to get My it right. My grandfather would be rolling in his grave, but <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I played that. Jason taught that, and I played another game that I I'm gonna leave that one for right now. It's coming soon, so it's a little surprise. And uh, no, I'm trying to think. I played Millennium Blades again. I, I love that Millennium game Blades. So Such much. a fun game. Oh my gosh, it's so amazing. I, I just I, and it was like. Five player game, Tom's like, are you guys crazy? Like, that's a lot of people, but we just had so much fun. I played another game of Argent the Consortium, another favorite. Actually, you know what? I don't think I played a lot of new games now that I think about it. That's nice. You know, it's it can be tough to always 
for the podcast, we try to play a lot of new games. So we have new games to talk about. And it's really nice to get to play games that you know already. So that's awesome. Right. So I see a question in the chat from, is it Neo? What is it? Neot, Neoteric? Neoteric, Neoteric Lefty. Lefty. So um, there's a game I played that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. You're subtle. <laughs> Nicely done. You're smooth. That's all I can say. <laughs> And yeah, speaking of which, hello to everybody in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Feel free if you have any questions for Mandy or I, just drop them in the chat. I see lots of friends that are frequently here and usually the chat ends up talking to each other more than they ask us questions. And I kind of love that. So that's cool. great. But I see friends like Kabuki Kid. Hello, Kabuki Kid. And Crystal and Kent and also Crystal. I like all these great oh, people. Crystal's so thank you so there. much. Don't hold back if you have any questions and we'll do our best to answer anything or be really unsubtle about them <laughs> like Mandy. Is. I don't know what you're talking about. Subtleties like my first name. Come on. Um. I'm impressed you can say that with a straight face, but okay. Uh, so let's see. Crystal is asking, what game surprised us the most in 2018 in a good or bad way? Ooh. So for me, it was the roll and write game Blocks out of oh, Essen yeah. because we did a lot of research before we went to Essen and I had lists and shopping lists and booth numbers and one of my goals at Essen was to grab every roll and write game that I didn't already have. And I met at this booth trying to grab a different game. And then I see this game and it looks like a roll and write game on the box. So I'm flipping it over, looking at the back. I'm like, whoa, I hadn't heard this. And then I saw the designer name, Klaus Jurgen Reed, the designer of Carcassonne. And it's a roll and write. I'm like, whoa, it was eight euros. I could not buy it fast enough. Um, completely had no idea. It wasn't even in the, the reason why I didn't know about it ahead of time was it wasn't even in the BGG preview list right um and it also happens to be excellent so for me the biggest surprise was very much a surprise and that was um the blocks roll and write game from nor wow. spiel i really 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 hope it gets picked up i know that um some of my friends have ordered it off of amazon.de and had it right. shipped to the u.s it seems like its availability goes on and off but anyway Okay. Yeah. No, I liked it. We had a lot of fun with that one. So it's a good one. So that, I think that's a really good pick. I'm trying to think, is there anything I talked about? My memory is so short. I'm so sorry. So I'm trying to think if there's anything I was like, oh, this is so good that I talked about with you. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I have so many, like I play every Saturday. I play a ton of games. Is there anything you can think of that I mentioned that I was like, what? This is so good. Um, no, I know. I'm like, I don't know. I'm trying to think. You know what? Hold on. I'm going to pull up my phone. So Th that's what you have to do, right? Is no, you have I, to... just, I seriously play so many. Like, I'm not even exaggerating when I say that. So sometimes I have to go, okay, let me go back and see. Oh, yeah, I remember this one. And if it was any good, I definitely have a couple that I was a little disappointed in, actually. Because um, oh, I was so love excited. hearing about the disappointments. I know. And I hate, and I hate saying that. But so. Newton, I knew, was going to be good, but I really liked it. I haven't gotten to play it yet. I'm really envious. No, I would say Newton for me. I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to be just another whatever, you know, and no, oh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. What yeah. do you like about it so much? It's one of those games where you feel like you don't have enough actions to do what you want to do. Like, it feels like you will, and there's a lot kind of going on. So you're like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. No, okay, got to focus on this. And you're trying to complete some of these tasks. And okay, no, I want to finish my my library to get the bonuses. And then it comes down to the last couple of rounds. You're like, oh, I'm not going to finish anything. Okay, what card do I need? I love that like feeling of, oh, I'm not going to finish all the things I need to do. And I'm like, okay, let's play it again. Do you know what I mean? I love that. So to me, it's like that tension, but in a good way. So I'm looking at my list, by the way. So I am listening. But I would say that one for me was one I wasn't expecting to like as much as I did. So. All yeah. right. That's cool. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Any big disappointments from 2018? Yeah, I got a few. <laughs> How do you tell? You want to pick was, one? Okay. Well, I haven't reviewed it yet. So I can tell you now that we'll talk more about it on the podcast. But I was disappointed with Way of the Panda. Sorry. Oh, was, really? Yeah. I and I really wanted to. Like, it was like one of those games where it goes, yeah, okay, it's good. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, okay, where's the next hill? Oh, no, no, still stay in there. Do you know what I mean? There was no crescendo to the game. I feel like it just kind of flatlined or, sorry, not flatlined, um, plateaued for me. So I didn't feel like there was anything to pull me back into the game. It was just like the same thing over and over. It was fine. 
fine. So it's not a game that I definitely want to, I don't need to own it. And it's disappointing because I was really looking forward to it, but it's not one that was one of my favorites. So I just feel like it just didn't have that, that lift to the game. It just kind of stayed at a certain place all the time. So I wasn't crazy about that one. Hmm. Um, yeah. So that definitely was one uh, that I was like, Meh. Interesting. And I really liked the action selection mechanism mm -hmm. in it where you know, you kept on having to move forward. I really like that. But area control, I'm pretty sensitive about. And right. I, whether you want to call Kemet an area control game or not, Kemet's one of my all-time favorite games. Uh, so it's not that I'm against area control, but I, I only like very specific ones. And I'm not quite sure what the tying together. So I really like the area control. Uh, the I'm sorry, the action selection element right. of Way of the Panda, but then the area control, the fact that it was driving this area control game, and the area control wasn't my favorite part right. of it. So, I mean, one half of it, I actually really, really liked, but then the right. other half of it, I was pretty like, eh, it's an area control game. And I think that's where I have to agree with you. We like that part of it, because it, you know, you had to, we were tight on the amount of people that you had to use to put there, but the area control part, I think that's the part that fell a bit flat for me. Like, it didn't lead, so, not lead anywhere, I just didn't feel that build for me. So, it just kind of dragged a bit, so... I was like, oh, wait, I remember one that I liked that I didn't expect I would like because I wasn't even going to buy it. You told me to buy it at Essen. <sighs> Airship City. Airship City. So good. No, seriously. I was like, oh, this is expensive, but I'll buy it. And I'm like, ooh, and I didn't know anything about it. And then we played it and my friends were like, this is so good. So Airship Cities. I don't know who the publisher is on that one. Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, it's Analog Lunchbox. It's a Analog wonderful Lunchbox. publisher out of Japan. They do slightly heavier games, but in very compact ways, typically. Uh, they have a couple of card games uh, that are fairly weighty, but they're all just cards, so the boxes are fairly um, small, which is really nice. It was, we'll talk about it on the podcast, because this was your pick, so I really want you to lead that discussion, but I really liked that, so I'm sorry. So that's that was another one that was a surprise. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> What about you? Any disappointments? Uh, well, as for anybody that listens to the podcast, you may know that Mandy and I have started up a segment called One and Done. And the response from listeners has been really positive. People, I know. like, we went to a convention and a lot of compliments about that segment. Uh, because let's face it, there are so many games coming out right now. It's hard to weed through. So if you find... Uh, a pundit that really connects with your style or, you know, describes what they don't like about it, it can be very helpful in assessing what you want to research further or what you want to purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that has to do with the flip side, not just the positive, but also the criticisms right. as well. And when I'm done, I think we get some of those out. So um, I've talked about a couple of them on one and done. There was a silly little game, and I'm going to cover it on one and done, so I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert it. But there's this game that came highly recommended from some friends of mine called Sky Joe or I've Sky Yo. It's a little card game, and it looked like a light. I love the Amigo Spiel, the NSV, these card games that come in very compact boxes like Six Nymphed and things like that. So it kind of looked like it could be one of those, and right. I bought it online and had it shipped and. Whew, that one. No good. Let's just say I have a wonderful core game group and <laughs> they pushed through to finish the game because wow. I wanted to see how it ended uh, just from a mechanical point of view. But they all no, it was it was not a popular one with my group. Oh, no. And you but, feel you feel bad. Maybe? I, I, you know, I, well, I feel for for my game group or for the game. Well, a bit of both. <laughs> a bit of both. Honestly, I I feel bad. My core game group, they're just they've got such a great attitude and they're willing to play pretty much anything. But every once in a while there's a thing. I'm like, well, we gotta I really wanna play this. You I kinda you kinda get the we'll we'll play what you need to play. Yeah, oh answer, that's the worst. Which then is you know. definitely the we don't wanna play it, but we'll do it for you. Exactly. And I appreciate that, but I do feel a little <laughs> bit about that. And I feel bad for the game. I want to like the games. I don't buy games with the intent of not liking them. Of course, of course. And so I'm sad for the game. I would much rather have a little card game that I fell in love with and was able to promote. So yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Ooh, I see Millennium Blade question in here. Yeah, oh, there's my. about the the fighting round with five players. 
yeah, so I thought it was going to be brutal. I thought it was going to be super long. Just, you know, because there's a lot of downtime. You know, when you're first when you're doing the um, setting up your decks, so you know they're doing the time round. So anybody who hasn't played Millennium Blades, it's one of those, it's very meta game. So, you know, it's like getting those collectible packs, setting up your deck. So it's like a game within a game and you're playing that game, that's literally Millennium Blades, and I love it. And in the game, you have several kind of timed rounds, or about seven minutes, and then it drops down to six on the third, where you're kind of setting up your decks, buying cards, and it's frantic, Like, but I love it. And you're setting up your, de- your deck for the tournament round. Um, and then that's where you're kind of going to kind of fight the other players, but based on the cards you have, you know, you might um, make them flip cards in their tableau, which prevents them from scoring and things like that. Uh, With five was great because we did a playthrough with three and it was still really good, but I really liked it at five. You definitely had that push and pull from the different players where one affected you and you're like, oh, I'm good. And then somebody else would do something that maybe, you know, affected something else. You're like, oh my goodness, I have so many other things to consider. I like the frantic nature of it. So for me, it was great. Um, I liked it at five actually, but I also played with people who uh, some people had played and some people picked on it, picked up on it rather quickly. Um, and this was at the retreat. So when he was at the retreat would have seen us playing. It took like two and a half hours or so, maybe give or take. Uh, but we had to explain for new players, but it was, I enjoyed it. That's, I I've, I do not get to, Millennium Blades is one of those games I thoroughly enjoy and I just can't get to the table very often, which is kind of sad. I know it's too, I'm hoping to do another playthrough of it soon because I, I really enjoy it. Let's see. Daga Louise is Luz is asking about Small Islands, which ah. is behind me. And Small Islands is a game, uh, I believe, out of Korea or Taiwan. I can't recall off the top of my head. And it's a tile lane game about building archipelagios and meeting. You get some gold cards and, and things like that. I have not played it yet. Uh, I very high on my want to play list. I love tile lane games. I love the theme. I love the art on it. Um, I, it's an interesting thing. I just got a huge shipment of games from Tokyo Game Market, oh, nice. which happened in November. Uh, I I'm pre-order a bunch, and then I'm lucky enough to have a friend that picks them up for me and ships them up, ships them out to me. It's an interesting conundrum I have right now because I really enjoy highlighting. And shining a light on games out of the Asian market that don't necessarily get a lot of coverage in the United States or Canada. But I've gotten some feedback lately that people don't like hearing about games that they have no chance of getting. And I want to find a balance because I also feel like if nobody's talking about the game, there's no chance for Western publishers to find out about them to see who's in, you know, does this little game have interest in it? Is it something I should be reaching out to the publisher in Asia to see if we want to do a partnership kind of thing too? So on one hand, I don't want to be a big tease about great games that I'm going to kind of oddly long lengths to get a hold of. But I also really want to show that there are amazing games that people in the West don't necessarily get to see. And that's a shame. You're missing out. And you can think about some games that have come out of the market that are just feel ubiquitous now, but Love Letter, don't forget, Love Letter from Seiji Kanai that started out um, in Japan. It's games like that, that that there's lots of little gems that we miss out on. So Small Small Islands is a game that I'm really excited to play. I want to review it, uh, and hopefully people won't mind that it may be hard for them to get if they're really interested. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But maybe the exposure will get them here. Like, look at Airship Cities. Like, we haven't talked about it yet, but I put a post up and people were asking, and it's hard to get here. But I'm hoping someone like Bosco from Board Game Bliss will maybe pull it in online. So you never know. New Tarek Lefty is asking, do we think the, the roll and write genre is getting oversaturated? Oh, maybe you should lead that off. I, I would... And in the kindest, gentlest way possible, I would turn that question back on you. And do you ask that question about any other genre right now or any other mechanism? Do you do you ask, are, is the worker placement market getting oversaturated? Or is the area control market getting oversaturated? And maybe your answer is yes. And that's totally fine. I think because of my fandom around this genre, this niche of games, for me, absolutely not. In fact, I'm only seeing more creativity more innovation around how some basic mechanisms are tied together, whether it's shared writing, whether it's different randomization elements, whether it's more strategic elements. 
all sorts of things like that. So for me personally, the answer is no, Mm -hmm. but I've heard plenty of people say otherwise. So I acknowledge my bias on that front. What about you, Mandy? I don't think it's oversaturated. I think we're hearing more about it. And I think you have some designers maybe kind of getting out of their, um, their kind of bubble that they're used to designing in and trying that because it's like, Hey, it's something new. People are kind of interested. So I think it's just because it's been thrust in the spotlight. People are thinking, Oh my goodness, it seems like a lot, but it's, you have to remember a lot. Some of these games have always been there. Like some of these games are not new. They're just being thrust into the spotlight. And you're like, Oh yeah, that's rolling right. And I'm like, sure. That's a game from 10 years ago. Do you know what I mean? But nobody knew about it. So I think that's what's happening. So a lot of these games are just being flooded in. It just seems like it's a lot. Th- that's just my opinion though. Like I could be completely wrong. So yeah. Uh, Kent, our friend Kent Parker is asking if you got to play Crown of Amara, and I want to know too. So, hi, Kent. Kent is from, uh, Mah- oh, nope, that's not the right Kent. Oh, I got there's someone from my hometown. It's not Kent. So, I'm like, sorry. Um, I didn't, Jason kept telling me how good it is, but okay. it was at the retreat. I wanted to play it, but like I said, there are other people that wanted to play some other games, and I was more than happy to accommodate that. It's on my list. I would really like to play it. I saw it for pre-order i think online somewhere so it's obviously got some kind of western distribution too so mm, maybe i gotta throw that on my order list huh maybe the cruise cruise is coming up so that's awesome we'll have to ask tom if he's gonna have it jason will bring it that's cool oh for sure daniel's asking if i play fireball island weekly at least (laughs) So for those of you who don't know, I have a six and a half year old and a 10 year old child. So yes, daily. Uh, And for those of you who also don't know, I help restoration games behind the scenes a little bit. So anything positive I say about the company or the game should always be taken with a grain of salt. I'm always being honest. I would never lie about anything, but I feel like that disclosure is super important. But that said, uh, I have these kids, and because I help restoration a little bit behind the scenes, I have access to the cooperative rules that are almost done playtesting. And for my six and a half year old who really does not like losing, uh, <laughs> we're finding cooperative is the way to play. And it right. is a lot of fun. It's very straightforward. So, yeah. And it's one of those things the kids especially my six-year-old, they they want to play at least twice. Just boom, you play a game. They want to set it up and do it again. And then they kind of, they're kind of done with it. We're playing a lot of it. So yeah, so definitely lots of marbles rolling around in my house. I still haven't played it yet. My copy is with a friend. I have to go pick it up. So they were kind enough to bring it back for me from PAX, but I've been traveling. So I'm excited to get it to the table. So looking forward to it. Oops, the chat. I hate the way the chat jumps it. <laughs> oh, I, but, oh, I found it. So there, oh, right. Hi, Ian. Ian O'Toole's in the chat. Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> There's a question actually here. This is a good one from Tig Biddy. What's a good roll and write for new gamers like my mom? That's so cute. Uh, I think every player is different. So I'm going to make some really big assumptions about your mother, which is fairly bold when you think about, I don't know your mom, mm. but When you're thinking entry, I usually am thinking fairly straightforward and something that feels familiar. So most people have Yahtzee as a baseline. Most families have played Yahtzee at some point, at least out in America they have. I really like games like Crisscross from Grail Games. It's Crisscross is great. Yeah, it's quickly moving up to my kind of number one, hey, I need a really light entry level roll and write game. Crisscross from Grail is pretty high up there. I also, easy to get, affordable is Quix, Q-W-I-X-X from Game Right Games. It's kind of the game that kicked Roll and Write Games up into gear uh, again in North America a few years ago. And I think it really stands up too for its its straightforwardness. Um, so I also really like Quix. So Quix and Crisscross, they're both really affordable. They're both really approachable and i like both of those a lot as kind of entry i use crisscross in my performance management classes actually that's so cool i know so so people are like why would you do that like what does that have to do with anything i'm like it's i actually use it as a communication tool i present it as a okay here you go you're gonna do this game so one person's gonna be like the the person who teaches the rules or the person's gonna kind of listen um so basically it's like manager and employee and you're gonna work together to try and figure out the game okay go ahead that's all i tell them so now they have to figure it out 
And then after it's done, I'm like, did you find that difficult? I didn't really tell you much about the game and I tell you to do it. I'm like, it's much like performance. If you don't tell employees how they're doing or have that communication, things get crossed. If you notice them, you got the rules wrong, you didn't quite understand. Anyway, you get the idea. So games are great for stuff like that. And crisscross is a nice one to use. And Steve O'Rourke, who I got to meet at PAX, I believe, and it was a pleasure to meet you, Steve. Uh, Steve O'Rourke is saying Nakmal is a great role and write. And I absolutely agree. I very much like Nakmal. I would say, and, and from a rule set, it's fairly straightforward. But what I would say about Nakmal is it can run a little bit long. Yeah. And for new players, players who are just kind of feeling around the edges, that game length is actually something that holds me back on Nakmal is kind of that entry level. I think you can get similar experiences uh, in some ways, maybe less strategic from a game like Quix or even 21 when 21 hasn't gotten picked up, darn it. And it really needs Ew. to get, right? you love 21, right, Mandy? Uh, I play it all the time. I love it. See? Uh, it might even be so, in my yeah. top 100. Maybe. <laughs> Spoilers. Uh, but yeah, Nakmal is a great roll and write. And Demo Weasel's in here <laughs> saying that it was great to meet us at PAX. It was oh. great meeting you too, kinda, <laughs> Demo Weasel. Because Demo Weasel says, too bad that they didn't get a chance to start on Mandy with their cosplay too. I'm, I'm there. I don't even remember. I was playing a game and all of a sudden I heard something over my shoulder. And I look up and I, you're expecting when you... You send somebody to buy, you expect you look up and you see a person, and it's like, oh, hi, how are you? Whatever, right? So, playing a game, I turn around and there's this giant weasel head <laughs> right next to me, and it scared the bejeebers out of me. I think there was a scream, and um, it was a very lovely person That's saying so hi. Great. That's it's so awesome. great. I love it. I love it. <laughs> next time. I encourage you, Demo Weasel, to find Mandy and give that experience to her as well. I don't know. I watch a lot of horror movies, so it's really hard to scare me. Uh, Robert Hunt's asking, what's a gaming marathon? That's what he thinks the Dice Tower does. And I think it's really cool that Robert's in the chat. Uh, must have found the, the, the stream that we're doing right now randomly. So the Dice Tower is a board gaming review and commentary channel and so they focus on everything to do about board games whether it's previews reviews showing you just what's called unboxings mm -hmm. uh just end to end there's there's variety shows like board game breakfast so a lot of content all the content basically on the channel is about board games they do gaming marathons as well and gaming marathons are typically just very long live streamed play sessions with some of the core team members who live out in florida tom vassal of course being the team lead who's very well known in the board gaming community along with z garcia and sam healy and some of the fine folks down there so it's gaming marathons they have a great camera setup you get to see them play the game you get to learn how the game is played you get to be part of the banter and watching Jason beat everyone in games. So that's a gaming marathon is similar to a video game gaming marathon. It's just long sessions of gameplay. Yeah, exactly. That's that sums it up. All right. Jen is asking what we're excited for in 2019. I actually haven't had a chance to look at what's coming up for 2019. Um, I know of some games that are coming to Kickstarter. Um, I'm going to be doing some um, previews and stuff for some games. Um, but I really haven't had a chance to look and I did play one that's coming in 2019, the one that I can't talk about. And uh, <laughs> I like it. So that was going to be one that's coming out and I, I, I really enjoy it. So but that's it. I haven't had a chance to look. Have you? Not, not so much, but one thing I'm actually excited about and I'm really hoping we can get this going is Mandy and I have some different kinds of content that we want to start producing. Somebody and, asked a question actually. Oh, that this I missed is it. going to relate to. Too no, I think chat. it's coming. No, I think it's coming up. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> uh, and yeah, where we have some other ideas about other shows that we could produce, other kinds of games that we could cover and try to cover them in a different way. And mm -hmm. we're doing some equipment setup and some testing. Who knows? Maybe we'll see a test stream sometime on Twitch or something like that. But uh, that's what I'm excited about. I'm The more I play games, I was just thinking about this. I was at a a board game flea market a couple of weeks ago. And this is a community. It's uh, up I live in the Seattle area, just north in Seattle a little bit. And people just have tables and you lay all your games out and you can trade and sell what you have. And it's it was a wonderful experience. And I 
what I was doing is I was sitting there for six hours and meeting people and talking to people and things like that. What it for some reason in that moment, it really hit home that I've been playing games for 20, 24 years now. Yeah, I still love games. I just love them. And I want to do talk more about them. I want to do more to spread the love of games. And so I'm excited about that with you, Mandy. Yeah, me too. I think it's great. I'm definitely wanting to streamline more of the stuff because I'm, well, you know, I'm really busy and I do a lot during the year. I definitely won't be traveling as much. Oh my goodness, that was insane. But I'm looking forward to our show. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back to the teach and plays that I did with Michael on Monday nights um, because we our space got flooded. It was this place that we filmed at. So we've been just doing recorded plays. We did Detective recently and I'm working on Hero Realms now. So getting back to more regular schedule and regular programming. I miss video. I mean, I do the teach and plays, but I think it'd be great you and I doing that to... Uh, um, that's that new content coming next year. Uh, let's see here. Bee Whoop, Bee Whoop is asking <laughs> if we have a favorite pie and if we have a different favorite dessert. <laughs> oh boy, I'm so boring. Like apple pie is probably up there for me. And um, so apple pie would be my favorite. And then I think closely followed by pumpkin. I really like pumpkin. Classics pie are never boring. I know, I really like that. And then different type of desserts. I mean, oh boy, I could always good for a go for a good flan. Or, um, wow, I got to think about this. I do like macarons. Mm. Those are delicious. This is why we get along, Mandy. This is why we're yeah, friends. Because so I, my mother's pumpkin pie is my favorite. And then I really like tart cherry pie or strawberry rhubarb pie. Mm -hmm. But then my too. second, if I was to pick a second dessert, I love custards. Like oh. flan is delicious. I love custards. So I like flan, but we don't put custard in it. No, no, no. A custard is like that baked creamy... Thing. Oh, I know a flan what it is. is literally a custard. What? How can you say you? No. When I say flan, I'm talking about. Oh, uh, we might be talking about different things. We call it something different. It's fruit, so it has like a fruit glaze. The fruit, it's kind of glazed, and it comes with a, like a cake. It's so good, and the cake's kind of oh, wet. I'm talking about like. Mexican I know what you're talking. Yeah. So my friend makes. So one of my best friends, she's a Chilena, and uh, like this like is something that Carmel. when I. Go to yeah, so when I went to her, like, so they would call it flan, but it was like literally fruits and then the, the cake it was like, so oh my gosh, it was so good. Anyway, I was <laughs> talking about it, I want some. So I really enjoy that. Noted. All right. <laughs> I think uh, we're not friends anymore, but that's okay. I'm sorry. It was a good run while it lasted. <laughs> Let's see. Eric's asking if we enjoy any legacy games or does it require a great amount of time, uh, too great of a time commitment to get to the through the entire game story. So it's tough. So I've so far I've only ever played uh, was it Charterstone. So any type of any type of legacy games or games where it has this, I would love to play more of them, but it's time. I just don't have the time. And we had to rush through Charterstone because I had friends that were moving. So we literally had to, I had a day off. My friend had to book a day off of work and we literally had to run through five games of it. Do you know what I mean? So I just have too many games to go through and too much content I'm trying to get out. So as much as I may want to play legacy games, it's a time thing for me. Mm, gotcha. I'm still trying to make my way through Thunderstone Quest. <laughs> which is a campaign, which is very... From a time perspective, very similar, right? Yeah. Well, sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, campaign, legacy, those type, anything that takes up that much time, it's just, it's time. It's hard for me to play. I agree. I would love to do legacy style games. It's it's a time thing. Although I do have, literally behind me, I have Rise to Queensdale, the oh. Inca and Marcus brand, because I love Inca and Marcus brand as designers. So I've got my sealed copy here. And with the holidays coming up, I have a little bit of time off. And so um, I'm looking at a couple of friends of mine, and we might try to do a, mar a one day marathon session to see how much we can get through just to have that experience. Cause yeah, it's, it's time. Yeah. If only, if only. I know more hours in the day, but I'm going to start doing my Thunderstone quest updates on the podcast again. I told my group, I'm like, Hey, you gotta get to it. <laughs> Eric's asking what game would both of us or either of us love to get under our tree and why? Hmm. So I was thinking about this. I haven't played it, but everyone's saying how good it is. And I think just based on that, I might want it. Is this smartphone game everyone's been oh. talking about? I don't know if it's any good. I don't know. Maybe that's something I might want to try. I've been hearing a lot of good things about it. It's one I actually had on my list to pick up at Essen, and somehow we completely missed it. Yeah, I, I don't know how we missed that. It wasn't on my list at all. But people kept saying, even Jason was like, it's so good. Tom's like, it's so good. Everybody at the retreat was saying how good, how good it was. So I'm like, maybe that needs to appear on my, under my tree so that I can try it. And... Captains of the Gulf. I have been trying to find that game. Good gracious. I think you order on BGG, but it's a little expensive. It's a pricier game. Well, it's also an American dollar. So that would be like 200 Canadian by the time it was all said and oh, done. Oh, 
Yeah. Sorry. What about you? Uh, I think for me, it's more games that I missed or games that sometimes I've traded away and wish I hadn't and things like that. So two games that are kind of just on my list for whatever reason are Roads and Boats. Which oh. is, I know. I, yeah, I would I take that. Which I, I regret passing on. And uh, Macau, which. M- yes, a felt. I, I love that game. I wish I had it. And, you know, it's out of print. I'm really holding on to the Tom Vassal Law of Gaming of if a game's good enough, it'll get a reprint. I'm I heard really, it's coming back. Is Macau coming back? No, I legitimately heard that. See, Tom Vassal's Law works again. And yeah, so that is that is one on my list for sure. Good choices. Yeah. Uh, Daniel is asking if we've played Keyforge. So yeah, so I have. I had um, Asmodee Canada uh, came over to my place. And no, it's not because, oh my gosh, I'm a celebrity. No, it's in Montreal, which is like an hour and a half from my house. So it's perfect. So uh, the representative came over for some games and uh, showed me Keyforge before it was launched. And um so he brought over several decks. We played in groups of two. And uh, I think our game went on the longest because our decks, I don't know what was going on, but they did not like each other. So our game went on for quite a while. Um, I liked it. It was fun. Do I need to own it? Not necessarily. Hmm. My group, it was felt the same way. Interesting. You don't have a background in CCG style games, right, Mandy? <sighs> that would be my brothers. And um, yes, yeah, so no, they do. I, I didn't. So I do. I played Magic. That's what got me into the kind of hobby niche world of gaming was Magic the Gathering in 94. And I have a lot of fondness for it, but I just cannot, just like with legacy games, I don't have the time to keep up with the meta and the constantly evolving game. And so deck building is just short of just doing something fun within my group or drafting or cubing or whatever. It's it's virtually impossible for me to keep up. So I really thought Keyforge was appealing from that no deck building perspective. I've got it. I've played it five or six times now. Mm. And I really like it. I like a lot of things about it. The deck names are ridiculous, of course, but that's fairly gimmicky when you think about it. Right. But gimmicks aren't necessarily bad. I, when the Wii came out, motion controllers were gimmicks and they were really rad. Uh, I like that there's no deck building. I like the excitement of opening a new deck and kind of getting that momentary rush that CCG collectors have a problem with. I have a problem with, so I have to be (laughs) conscious of that. Um, I really like the mechanisms. Of course, the random deck builds can mean you get really weird games. And if Mm -hmm. you don't have super experienced players maximizing their deck kind of out of the box, it's a little bit wonky for sure. I'm seeing competitive play getting really interesting. I like in the competitive world, they're doing this thing where you play, you open your decks, you play, you swap, and then you bid. You swap and you play, and then you bid for the, la- for the last one for which deck you want with Amber and stuff like that. And I think that that's a really interesting competitive way to play. Mm. But I, I would say the one consistent thing I have felt in my plays is it ran just a touch long yeah. to get to those three keys. Does that mean I'm not enjoying the game? No, it just means that I, I, I've not played it enough to figure out which decks are the right ones for me to feel like I'm getting the game length that I want out of it. But it's yeah. it's a very cool and so far, obviously, very successful game experience. No, it's doing well. And I get it. Like, the price point's really good. And like you were saying, for people who do, you know, who are part of that collective, uh, collectible card games, you know, they're like, oh, no, you have a deck. It's set like there you go do you know what i mean and if you want to buy multiple sets you can and it's not going to break the bank versus like you have to keep buying certain things it's not that that obligation isn't there um i think it's great and i think it's a great opportunity for people to kind of jump into that without feeling so much of a commitment uh it's one of those games for me if someone brought it to the table i'd play it i enjoyed it it's just not a game i need to have hmm. there you go i shoot they score is saying that they were watching some old top tens about pop culture that tom sam and z have done and is there any chance that we would do something similar I mean, mean, if we do pop culture top tens, I love talking to Mandy about pop culture because we have very odd shared. We have very few in some ways, like Golden Girls. We, but you come up with things like Littlest Hobo. Yes, the Littlest Hobo. It's so good. Which is a thing in Canada, but was not in the U.S. It is so good. You all should check it out. I don't know if it holds up, but. Or the raccoons? It's like yes. Lassie. The rac- oh. What? The rac- what? Oh, co- okay, there must be a Canadian in that chat. If you do, the raccoons is great. 
Actually, Australians, I think, know it too. <laughs> and with me, you're just going to get a lot of cartoon references because I watched uh, the a ton of cartoons. The is a cartoon, by the way. And I continue to watch a lot of cartoons as an adult. So you're going to hear a lot about like snorks and thundercats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, those are great. So uh, we could do it. Yeah, I would look into it. <laughs> this will be <laughs> funny. I, I would mostly just make make fun of them. Uh, I should. Oh, and here's following that. I should. You score is also saying curious about my top ten graphic novels or Mandy top ten horror films, for example. Ah, uh, so I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah I do that. I worked in a comic book store for a few years, so I am still very much a very much top a- ten horror films. That's great. <laughs> Eric's asking, do companies do enough to encourage women to get into game designing? That's Mm. a very complicated question. Very much so. What I will say, Eric, is, I mean, enough is a very hard thing to quantify. I will say I see publishers doing more and more, both kind of officially through channels, whether it's doing game design contests or things like that, but also kind of softer things behind the scenes at game conventions and things like that, really making an effort to to connect with women who are... trying to get into game designing and just having supportive and guiding conversations with them and things like that. And I think um, to encourage more women to design games and get into that or just become more visible in that, there are already tons of women designing games. You just may not be hearing about them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there are a number of publishers who are really stepping up and trying to do more on that front, which is really nice from my perspective. It's really nice to see. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's one of those things, right? It, over time, things are going to change. You're going to hear more of certain things. Um, and you're right. There are a lot of designers behind the scenes that we don't even hear about. So maybe that um, publicizing them a little bit more. But no, I definitely think it's going in the right direction. I mean, we can always do more, right? In anything that we do. Absolutely. And and it's tough, too, because pu- some publishers have done things like game designs open primarily to women. And they've gotten a lot of backlash, too, from people who felt like that was unfair. And and right. so it's it's a tough thing for publishers. I respect that. Mm-hmm. Kabuki Kid is throwing down saying Watchmen is easily one of the best graphic novels. I, I can't argue with that. But so <laughs> good on you, Kabuki Kid. It's a good one. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Also, yeah, Daniel saying send pie. I I love you. That's that's <laughs> good. Hi. Oh my gosh, this is how, how far behind we are in the chat. Yikes. Oh wow. Okay, we're chatting way too long. Sorry. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> CB saying, please explain for dummies how to play magic. I, I will just say this. First of all, don't force it. If you don't want to play magic, I get that you have a peer group that does it, but don't don't force yourself to play a game that you don't think you like it. I would say for me, the the easiest way to get into magic is through pre-constructed decks. Magic themselves sell pre-constructed decks. They even come with play guides on on how they're meant to be played. I will also say there's one of the biggest online magic stores called Card Kingdom. They created this wonderful system where they're creating starter decks. And these are fairly mechanically simple decks that you can purchase. They're inexpensive that are really designed to help you learn the game and doing some constructed with maybe one of your friends that knows how to play that isn't hyper competitive, isn't going to like crush you out of the gate uh, is, is one great way to do. I would play around with the formats. I wouldn't necessarily go into competitive magic right away, but there are formats like either doing pre-constructed or drafting's a little interesting. Uh, I, I would do sealed like sealed's always a, anyway. Um, try, try some of those pre-constructed if you want to, if you, if you really want to get into it, but don't force yourself. Magic's, Magic's a beast. Or just borrow your brother's decks. <laughs> <laughs> I had so much trouble. So much trouble. We won't talk about that. <laughs> Meeple Overboard must have missed the beginning because they're asking if your sweater lights up to see on camera. And it does. Does it? My sweater lights up which? I didn't hear. Enough to see on camera. Yeah, here. I, t- I turned it off because I didn't want to, you know, just seriously, there are some people who are really sensitive to light. So I didn't want to keep it running for too long. I think you can all see it. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. You're okay. There you go. Amanda Panda is asking, is Keyforge secondary market too pricey? I have not even looked once at the secondary market, so I have no comment on that. Yeah, neither have I. Dag Louise is doing the Thundercats cry, and uh, Emma G's got your support on raccoons, apparently. What's which this? is a thing. There's a witch I didn't hear. Emma G is saying, yes, raccoons. Yes. <laughs> Gold it's been a while. Canada. It's been a while. You need to look it up. Devil Weasel they... says that they watched all of the raccoons fairly recently. Cyril Sneer. 
Oh, somebody's talking about gummy bears. Oh dear, we're we're getting into cartoon zone, and that's really. Oh, it's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. This is bad. This is bad. <laughs> is Ian O'Toole typing the theme song to Little Hobo? I love it. I love Wait, it. There's a voice that keeps calling on me down the road as we're all. Isn't that Little Hobo? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like Little Hobo is like that dog. It's kind of like Lassie. It's a crime solving dog like that's a on a Lassie. journey across the country. Yeah, but he like he doesn't belong to any family or anyone. He's you know, it's its own dog. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. Daniel's saying maybe Nyctophobia will help progress some female designers because of course, Nyctophobia, a very innovative game designed by um a young woman. I will also say. There are actually a lot of women designers that I think are just invisible. Yep. Uh, for example, Quirkle, Spiel de Yars Quirkle, designed by a woman. There are actually a lot of mass market games that don't uh, give credit to their designers in the box of the rules that actually have in their house, their in-house designers are women as well, or mm -hmm. invention shops that have women um, that are pitching games to them and that they buy them from. So um, maybe Nick Fobio will progress. I think that there are women working there, and sometimes it's even just about Shining a light on those who are already there. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so much gummy bears. I loved gummy bears. And now <laughs> the theme song is stuck in my head. Ah, I love it. Someone's stuck in my cereal snare. High adventure that's beyond compare. Oh my There's the gummy bears. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Our views are going to go like, Meh. what are they talking about? Know, <laughs> they can get her off. Get the gong. I love it. Everyone knows Cyril Sneer. This is great. I'm so What's sorry. Cyril Sneer. You got to say it right though. Cyril Sneer. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. Okay. <laughs> oh, Dark. Why no Darkwing Duck games? I love Darkwing great Duck. question. I do love that what IDW did the recently did the Kickstarter for the Nickelodeon game and it had the Rugrats in it. Oh, Rugrats, yeah. And I love that. I watched the Rugrats. Back in the day, and I thought it was pretty cool that they had that going. I think and Jonathan Ying swept in and, and helped design that one. That was oh, that's cool. great. Oh, Gamer Joe, saw you playing Blackout Hong Kong at the retreat. Was curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I did a very detailed chat about it with Suzanne on podcast. Was that 583? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was I the one so. before two the one ago, that's yeah. out. So two episodes ago, I think, or so. Anyway, go check it out. I give and oh wait, Suzanne, everybody quite enjoyed uh what you called the pillar do you remember the uh there's a purple, Fisher's purple power pillar and he liked it he enjoyed this name <laughs> <laughs> it is i mean what else is it it's this big purple column that is the first it's like it shows that you're the first player and it marks the 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 round the phases of the game Fisher's purple power pillar there you go so it's canon yes. it better so, be in the rule book next edition i think it's great so if you want to get to the, the end of it I really liked it. I've taught it a million times. It's so good. Alexander Fuster is one of my favorite designers. But if you want to hear me get into more detail, check out the podcast. How very, what it, like, that's such a teasy thing. I love no, it. That's <laughs> way to bump the podcast. Yeah, let's get those listeners. You could just fast forward to that part if you want. I mean, I won't be offended. <laughs> Scroll you up a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. Kabuki Kid says that uh, there are some graphic novels and roll and write uh, Mad Libs and things like that, which no Mad, Mad Libs, Libs are not a roll and write game. Okay, I'm walking away from that thought. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but Kabuki Kid mentions the Van Ryder graphic novel adventures, which I am a huge fan of. And what's really awesome is, oh, so my kids are in the house and they can probably hear me. So I'm going to go quieter here. I found another series of kind of choose your own adventure graphic novels for kids Ooh, not fantastic. maybe quite as puzzly as the graphic novel adventures but i'm so excited about it it's gonna be for a holiday gift so yeah. oh, they're gonna love that yeah. oh that's so great um and let's uh Daga louise is asking if frustration games is found a distributor for fireball island in asia especially in taiwan i don't know about taiwan uh but i can tell you that it has a korean distributor uh i man do games out of korea is publishing it there and I think there's one in Japan as well, but I can't confirm. Um, so hopefully you can get a copy of the game out there because I think it's good, pretty cool. So before you continue, because we're we're getting close to time up, we still have like about oh 10 gosh. minutes. Time flies. But we had a question we were going to ask in this Q&A. So anybody who listened oh. to the podcast would have heard our chat about 
um, gaming etiquette, like putting it away, yeah, set up and clean up. Right. And um, then we went off a little tangent and I talked about my rules, <laughs> which I don't think is weird. Mandy, I, it's not weird. It's just very specific. And you had a flow chart of if then statements on where Mandy will place the rule book in a box when she packs it up. And there's a whole flow chart that we could design about what are the game components? How do they sit? Like all this other. Oh, my goodness. So but what we're talking about and I talked about a pet peeve of mine and nesting boxes and box bottoms and box lids. So we thought it'd be fun to ask you all about your gaming pet peeves little and let's be very clear pet peeves aren't like somebody being rude or dumping a soda on your game board that's just stuff that's wrong right <laughs> pet peeves are little things that you personally for whatever reasons blow up in your head as just something you despise like for me nesting the box bottom and the box top when you're playing the game that's not a big deal up here, I kind of know that, but I hate it so much. That's a pet peeve, and I really do hate it. So anyway, no, that that's I have to agree with that one. That one's bothersome. And for those who didn't hear about my rules, I prefer to put the rules on the bottom. Now, if the board goes on the bottom, the rules should go on the bottom, and all the pieces on top. Close the box. However, if there is an insert or the boards have to be on top, then the rules should go on top. That way they don't get bent. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's that's it. That's that's three more conditions more than I have. And then for uh, those who are like, oh, well, I need the rules to read right away. Well, guess what? We have technology. I can just pull them up on my phone if I'm really needing to get them at the moment. But everything's got to come out of the box anyway. So what does it matter? <laughs> Amanda Panda is saying that their pet peeve is when a person licks their fingers and touches the game. Oh, that's gross. Uh Mm. when does somebody do that oh i've seen it like if like especially if they're eating something oh like and then like let me touch your cards like, oh yeah that's uh, game. <laughs> <laughs> no that, that, i can see where that would be pretty gross bending yeah. cards let's see brian is saying bending cards while playing is a bad one. Oh, can you imagine you're sitting there and it's like this there's a card and they're oh and well, then I'm I, like, think, no! I think people rest it on. I I see it where you know they rest it on the the thing, and it, it you know they kind of just rub it on the table, and they're bending the card. I've seen that before. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, that's bad. they're fiddling. You know, they're fiddling. Yeah. Well, I have ADHD too, and I don't do that to cards. A Ambie, hi, Ambie. Ambie's in the chat, oh. and Ambie says that they pack it up with the rules on the bottom so they don't get bent. So you Thank have you. support from beautiful Ambie. Thank there you, you go. See. Someone I mean, if Ambie says it's normal, then. That is right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going back to just regular game chat, uh, new Tarek Lefty asked if I play uh, Stuff Fables with my kids. I absolutely do. Uh, I will say I don't love the rule book. I would make sure that you're prepared to be soft on the rules, especially if you're playing with younger kids. And the way I just basically adapt it is, especially with my younger one, whatever makes the game fun we just roll with because the rule book's a little iffy in some cases, but mm -hmm. I love stuff fables with both my 10 year old, uh, my, my eldest just turned 10 and my six and a half love stuff fables. It's Oh, Jeff, it, 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 he had a guy who licked his thumb every time he had to draw a card. Mm. Oh, that is so gross. Mm. Mm. And Daniel's saying that their potion explosion dispenser got almost destroyed because it got put away incorrectly. And the, it was getting crushed. Yeah. Oh, no, Putting man. with games properly is is good. It's important. Rules under the insert. That that seems extreme, don't you think? Yeah, I don't do that. But generally, the board, wherever the board is, I think is a good area for it. But, I mean, that's not a bad thing. As long as they stay flat. So, hey, if you got to put it under the insert, I'm okay with that. I feel like Ian is getting a little too real right now. Ian saying the most important thing to do when packing a game away is to forget about oh. one tiny piece and have to open the whole thing up again when you thought you were done. That's just, uh, -uh. you make me shudder just thinking about it because that happens every time, Ian. Or when you put them in the wrong way, I've done that. I put it in the box lid, lid instead of the bottom. Yeah. Do that a lot. I, 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 for me, it's usually I put the game away and I'm standing up to put the game 
on a shelf or on a table or more likely just dump it in the pile on the floor. And I right. look down and then there's a coin or a token on the floor. And I got to pick that up. And Netters just jumped in. Hi, Netters. Hello. Karen had a kid dump a pitcher of lemonade on Rummy Cube. Oh. Isn't Rummy Cube with tiles, though? Wouldn't that just be able to be washed? Yeah, but some of the tiles, I guess if you let it sit too long, they they um, blow up like wheat. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Demo it's, it's, Weasel it's, saying, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I see one, though, but go ahead. Oh, Demo Weasel saying that their pet peeve is when they're playing a game with lots of interaction, someone in the lead starts whining when people start to attack them. Oh, <laughs> I've seen that happen. <laughs> oh, I've definitely seen that happen. Hmm. Then don't be first. Ha, ha, ha. Riffle shuffling. Now, riffle shuffling seems very divisive. I am a riffle shuffler. As am I, but I always ask. If it's someone's game, I'm like, do you prefer that I, I do, do ask. it overhand? Or would you? And I always ask. For me, when people ask me, I'm like, no, it's meant to be played. It's I don't care. That's fine. But yes, I always ask. Yeah, for sure. Riffle shuffling just seems super divisive in the community. Yes, I, don't I agree know. 100% with you on that. Uh, yeah. I have a, a pet peeve of mine is in teaching games. I want one teacher. It doesn't even yes. matter if I'm the teacher. Even if somebody else is teaching the game, I I don't like it when somebody's trying to teach the game and somebody else is trying to co-teach unless yeah. it was prearranged. And I have played games where the core teacher says something like, I haven't played in a while. Feel free to jump in or something like that. And that's great. But when... It just drives me bonkers when somebody's trying to teach a game and so well, don't forget about this or this. And you know, maybe the person just hasn't gotten to it or they're teaching in different right. order or whatever. And uh that and and certainly when I'm doing it, I I I try to be very upfront if I don't know game very, very well. And if I'm just uh you know, I want some but if I know a game, I'm like, I'm good, I got it. Me too. Like you're just about to say it, and I'm like, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. And, or sometimes this has happened to me. It happened so much. I, and I and I usually don't get upset, but I literally was like, would you like to teach the game? And I hand them the book because I'm like, you know, you seem to, to really want to teach it. And I just leave it at that because I'm like, I can't. It's just, it gets frustrating. Yeah. Let's see here. Eddie is saying that their pet peeve is the person who brings their kid. Oh, no. Huh? Wait a minute. Wow. Wait a minute. What's happening here? <laughs> then we have to play a game the kid wants to play or the kid will pout. Well, that's okay. I so it's not necessarily that the kid has come, it's that the kid is demanding right. somehow that this arrangement demands a very specific game night all of a sudden. And I can understand that. That seems especially if it's not prearranged, that seems highly unfair. So well, I get that. No, okay. Absolutely. No, no, I totally get that. Absolutely. I was ready to get all defensive on you and be like, hey. <laughs> but I I read the cool question and now I understand. <laughs> all right. Jessica is saying a pet peeve is when people jiggle their pieces and make noise constantly. Okay, the only one, okay, the only game I do that with is Azul. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I have to like, anyway, the bag with the tiles. I like the sound it makes. I, um, I, if, if any game has standard size poker chips, back in the day in college when my friends and I were playing poker a lot with, we thought we were so fancy because we had real clay poker chips and all this other stuff. We all were learning po chip tricks to do yeah. while you were sitting there, like shuffling your chips or rolling them across the back of your fingers, which I never could do. Um, and I, if I have a game that involves standard size poker chips, I, I, I very much struggle to not shuffle them. Yes. In front of me, so oh, I might be one of those people. Uh oh, sorry, Jessica. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, it's 11.01, so I don't know if we want to okay. stop it there. I know yeah. it's getting, like, really, all of them are coming in. So I know, there's some, we'll have we to. We might have to do a part two or something. We'll just do a Victory Points episode. And if you don't listen to the podcast, I'm sorry, uh, the podcast does get put up on YouTube in a YouTube video as well, and there's pictures of the games added and things like that. So uh, maybe we'll do a whole Victory Points segment on Pet Peeves, and we'll put a, a thread up in the Dice Towers Board Game Geek Guild about pet peeves and people can just go to town. Yeah. Just get it all out. Everyone's showing up now that we're leaving and it's like, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's okay, Jeff. You, Jeff's saying that he doesn't listen to the podcast. Oh, ha -ha, no. Jeff. I'm sure he listened to it many times. Oh, and the Brothers Murph. Well, there you go. All, you know, that's, that's, that's there. Tone is talking about non-topped drinks right by the game. 
having open cups. Oh, that just would yeah. make me nervous, right? I, I'm klutzy. So I legitimately, if I have a drink, I'm like, I'm going to put that on the floor or something. Cause I just, it makes me nervous. Like five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian M is saying maybe we can do a roll and write live sometime, like welcome to or something similar. I am totally down for that. We've actually done that for um, around Gen Con. We do something called Gen Cant and we've done these live mega plays and last, and this year welcome to was that game. And it was so much fun. That said, the Brothers Murph who just joined the chat also do that. If you're not familiar with the Brothers Murph, you're really missing out. Those bing bongs, they call themselves that. I'm not calling them that <laughs> without their permission. Those bing bongs are amazing. And they do some live plays with Roll and Write style games that are interactive with you who are watching. So you should check that out too. But Mandy, I would love to do. Yeah. And maybe that was some of what we are talking about earlier on about some new shows coming out. So exactly. I always join. Yes, I joined the Brothers Murph and I, for some reason, turned the conversation to Putin. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kabuki says eating with Cheetos. No, Cheetos, unless you're using chopsticks oh. to pick them up, they don't belong at the table. Yeah. Like, no, don't do it. No. All right, everybody. It is our time. And I'm so glad that you all joined us. Thank you so much. It's, so and honestly i'm kind of bummed because i'm loving seeing all these pet peeves and We're things so like that so if you if you are on the board game gale we will be getting that thread up eventually please chime in because i think reading about the pet peeves is flipping hilarious it's so good i can't wait and before you jump off i know somebody had asked i don't think we answered it yet the next podcast coming out I don't know if you yep. want to mention that. Oh, yeah. So the next podcast that airs next week is going to be the end of the year spectacular. Uh, all for the podcast crew, Tom Vassell, Eric Summer, Mandy Hutchinson, and myself will be on there talking about the best and maybe some of the worst of 2018. <laughs> Just know if you're listening to it, if Mandy sounds cool and buttery smooth inside, she's just anxious as heck because these these kinds of lists just make her very anxious so it stressed me out like very really stressed, stressed out, out. <laughs> yep but uh so feel free to give that a listen and i think it's a great it'll be a great year and recap i think uh one of the great things about the podcast crew is that we have different game tastes and so if you're going to hear about the tops of a year from one person, and if you associate with that person really well, then that's awesome. But the nice thing about this podcast is you're going to hear from four different people who have four different game tastes. So you might hear about some games you didn't know about. Uh, and I think that's always fun. All right. Thanks again, everybody. I love all the chat and I'm sorry to see it go. I, I hope you have a wonderful night. If you have a holiday coming up, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. And I hope that you join us next time we do a live Q&A in the new year. Exactly. Mandy, you got to turn your, your you got to put your antlers on. Oh, hold on. Wait. Oh, I got to I got to like exit with. OK, there we go. There we go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I have to like do this. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye.